think we've reached a critical mass. Um, so uh, welcome everybody to this webinar um, for AO uh, North America trauma uh, subdivision about elbow dislocations uh, titled Good, Bad, and the Ugly, sort of techniques on coronoid repair, radiohead replacement, just general discussion. <clears throat> I'm Jonah Davies. I'm uh, at Harvard Medical Center in Seattle, and I have with me, very lucky to have Andy, Andy Chu from uh, Houston and Marshall Burks from St. Louis. Um, really um, good perspectives on the topic and really interesting people to have on here. So I'm really happy that they said yes. <clears throat> um, here's our disclosures. AONA uh, is an independent nonprofit, and you have all the other uh, mission statements here. Render uh, Zoom etiquette. Please send questions through the Q&A as the chat and the microphones will not work. Um, and so really what we're here today to talk to uh, talk about is uh, complex elbow uh, trauma, uh, because it does cause a, a fair bit of anxiety in, in treating surgeons. And um, at least I know for myself and I know for uh, the rest of the panel, we typically get a lot of referrals based on this because it does cause a little bit of anxiety and, and confusion sometimes. So hopefully after today, we'll be able to um, to demystify some of the uh, problems of that. The learning objective is really going to be to <clears throat> uh, recognize different patterns of elbow uh, instability and elbow fracture uh, dislocation patterns, describe and uh, be able to be familiar with treatment and uh, approaches uh, for the coronoid and similarly with the radial head. And so we'll do a quick introduction and then we'll have some uh, basic talks and then just go on to some cases and hopefully um, keep everybody entertained. So I will get started with a with a basic talk. And please do not hesitate to put questions into the Q&A. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, elbow fracture dislocations. Here's my conflict slides. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is uh, come up with a uh, common language, I think, for uh, describing patterns and recognizing patterns in fracture dislocations. And just really understanding basic treatment principles. And I'll go over some very basic tips and tricks to kind of help people um, uh, see where we're coming from. So um, we're going to look at most of the different types of elbow fracture dislocations, so starting on terrible triads, look, going into ter uh, uh, Montageous terrible triads, a little bit more rare, but, but definitely present post-remedial uh, fracture dislocations, and then uh, something a little bit more uh, difficult, but maybe how to deal with chronic elbow dislocations. And the most important thing, if I want you to remember something from this entire talk, is really the goal is going to be how do you leave the OR with a stable elbow, not a almost stable elbow or should be fine elbow, but really how to leave with a with a stable elbow. So here's you know a lot of spectrum of injury, a lot of different uh, potential problems with these elbows, and I think really how we have to think about it is um, that it's a spectrum of instability, right? They're simple, simple-ish. Uh, fractures, i.e. those that are uh, ligamentous only, but there can be some more complicated ones within that. And then truly the definition complex elbow fracture dislocation uh, means that there has to be a fracture uh, associated. We include transalecranon fractures in these, although they're not really true dislocations in the sense of the term. The elbow is dislocated, and so it's included. And then Montagia's terrible triads, and then these combined weird uh, patterns. So I think one thing that's important to know if you haven't really seen these, the montages and the transalecranons can look similar, uh, specifically the type 2D montages, which have in, um, uh, sort of comminuted involvement of the alecranon and the joint. Um, but really what you want to look at is uh, the integrity or not of the proximal radial ulnar joint. You can see the difference maybe between these two. They look kind of similar, but in one, the PRUJ is intact, and in the other, it isn't. Um, and so really when treating these, it's a very different um, type of algorithm to know, and then also to look for the potential ligament tear. So for me, just basics of Montagia fractures, treating the ulna, right? And so to do that, I typically do these in a, in a, in a uh, lateral position, although it can be done prone. Um, and then really what you want to do is just get good x-rays beforehand, be able to um, uh, see well, and then just expose as maximally invasive as needed, although typically you don't need to go all the way up the humerus, uh, you can make it sort of available to you. The real idea with montages is to fix them uh, anatomically, uh, reduce the, the, uh, the, the ulna as anatomically as possible here. I'm using multiple modified clamps, K-wires, uh, sometimes get dared by the residents and fellows to see how many clamps we can put in a wound. I can tell you that the record for me is nine in an elbow. Um, 
But then once you get it reduced, uh, you want to make sure the radio uh, capitellar joint is well reduced. And if it's not, I think the message is really check your ulna reduction. Um, and then if that's not uh, the source of the problem, then you can look into the joint, maybe capsulotomy and check ligament instability. So, you know, although the Montagia can be difficult in theory, uh, in reality, I think if you treat the ulna adequately and get it reduced anatomically, then uh, the rest tends to follow. Uh, sometimes these need a radial head replacement when dealing with the um, uh, radial head. Uh, you know, the classic Montagias are dislocations, but those other newer or described ones that have a radial head fracture as well uh, can, can benefit from a radial head arthroplasty. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in Dr. Birx's talk. Um, and then look for the uh, look for the injury for the ligament because it's much more common than um, than we think. About twenty five to thirty percent of these have a, a ligamentous injury, so look for that. So I think this is one of the more common uh, fractures that we see, and it's quite uh, simple when you break it down to its parts. And I think that that covers that relatively well. Uh, the next one is terrible triad. I think this is obviously well known. Uh, it's a radial head uh, fracture uh, with a elbow dislocation with a ligament injury and a coronoid fragment uh, fracture. And in reality, they're probably not so terrible. I think some of these in older patients that are well reduced can be treated unoperatively, but really what you need is a treatment protocol uh, for treating these operatively as most young patients would be uh, operative uh, fixation. And so this is the seminal paper that kind of looked at that. Um, and really what you wanna do is to position these patients. I do, I do it supine. Uh, you want the elbow to be elevated enough to be able to get good and imaging without having to rotate the elbow to stress any uh, repair that you're doing. And so we all know, or at least we should know that the uh, decisions to fix or replace the radial head comes first. And so if you do decide to uh, fix the radial head, then you can uh, get the pieces out of the way and go after the coronoid. Typically I'll suture most of the coronoids if they're small and you can see here the arrows, there's some drill holes, holes through the um, ulna going into the corner base and then passing sutures through. At that point, um, I will fix or replace the radial head and then repair the lateral ulnar collateral ligament and really um, then test stability. And at that point, we're then either repairing the MCL or adding an extra um, amount of fixation with either an external fixator or a joint stabilizer. The approach for these is uh, through a lateral based approach. Most of the time you're going through a Coker style approach as the ligaments are off, uh, the danger really is lessened to any neurovascular structures. And so um, it's the prefer preferred approach. You can also do an extensor split or a Kaplan type approach, although it's not necessary most of the time. Here's sort of what it looks like. You cut through the fascia, there's Ancaneus. Um, and then it's truly a um, intermuscular approach. You can see there's no dissection of muscle, just really going through the different muscle heads. You get right down onto capsule, and you can see quite well. Again, the extensor split is more useful for capitellum and, and trochlea fractures if you have to extend it proximally, or if there's an isolated radial head fracture, but not really applicable in these. And then there's real life. You know, you get in there and there's a, a coker and a Kaplan at the same time. And so you just kind of have to make it into what it's uh, what you need for that um, that surgery. Uh, with regards to the medial side, there's lots of different approaches. So Taylor Sham, Hotchkiss, over the top. There's a, a flexor pronator mass or an FCU split. There's lots of different ways to split it: two thirds, one third, two fifty fifty. And I think what what matters mostly is knowing the anatomy and really adapting the approach for the fracture pattern. So if you have a coronoid fracture. Um, that's at a different level, trying to get the best approach so that you can buttress that fragment as best possible, and then also repair ligaments if needed. A specific type of uh, complex, I would say, elbow dislocation is really these poster medial dislocations. They are less common, but they're important to recognize. You can see on the bottom, they have kind of a classic pattern of injury uh, with a varus force and then um, an anterior medial coronoid fracture. You can see the lower uh, right has a CT scan with 3D reconstruction. And the problem with these is if they're treated in a, um, incompletely, they tend to have residual instability and will go very quickly on to arthritis. And so really what you want to do is be able to address uh, the medial side with the uh, bony uh, work, but also remember to repair the lateral side so that they stay um, stable. Because typically, if only one side is um, fixed on the medial side and the lateral side is not, they will remain unstable. This is uh, my stability test I use for almost every fracture dislocation of the elbow. So I'll test it in flexion, 
at 90 uh, and then uh, mid flexion and then I'll go full pronation full supination and then in full extension and do the same and I'm really looking at radio capitellar joint congruity and also ulnohumeral congruity and if there's any uh, incongruity with supination then you're looking at posterior lateral rotary instability um, and if there is any ulnar humeral instability with pronation, then that'll typically make me go to the medial side. Finally, I think uh, very challenging cases to all of us are whenever these patients uh, have injuries that are uh, chronic. So these typically happen because they were referred to somewhere else or the patient didn't really know that their elbow was dislocated and you know thought it was just a sprain. Um, these are very uh, challenging because you have to make them more unstable before making them more uh, stable again. So typically they have heterotopic ossification or uh, uh, scar tissue. So you have to release them and then reduce them and then reconstruct them. And then typically I will add some sort of internal brace uh, or a internal joint stabilizer and uh, an external fixator. So here is Kind of what that looks like with it reduced now and there it is in an internal joint stabilizer and the elbow is uh, quite stable um, sometimes they need an external fixator static and here's another uh, example of what that is and those are typically left on for about four weeks um, so really take home points are uh, complex elbow trauma is not easy <laughs> but it's not that complex if you break it down into its smaller parts um, the bony injuries should get stable fixation and articular injuries need anatomic reduction. I think ligamentous repair or reconstruction is essential for most of these, knowing how to do it, where to, to put, oh, sorry, where to put your anchors and how to, um, to repair it is, is key. Um, typically, you know, you want them to get early range of motion to prevent uh, stiffness. I don't use the dynamic protection braces. I think that they cause more instability. So you just have to make sure that the elbow leaves the OR stable enough. And hopefully this will help you um, with your newfound love of elbow trauma. So that was a fast introduction, but I think uh, it'll help set the table for our next talk, which will be Dr. Burks. Um, while he's loading that up, I did see a question in the Q&A about how to get a perfect lateral in the OR. And I think uh, knowing the anatomy of the uh, trochlea as well as the capitellum and being able to adjust both the uh, abduction, uh, adduction of the elbow, as well as internal and external rotation, and then starting to get familiar with how all those play together. Um, that's how you get better better imaging in the OR. I don't know if, if Marshall, you have any other uh, tips or tricks. No, I mean, it's just trial and error and Quite honestly, it's a little bit frustrating at times, but just um, I think what just just what uh, Dr. Chu described in the chat and you said. All right, so uh, let's segue to how we manage the radial head in these fracture dislocations in 10 minutes or less. And uh, we'll talk about, uh, you know, why we do it, how we get there, what we're going to use, how not to screw it up or potentially be successful even. And the font size should indicate uh, the you know relative frequency of which you're doing these things. At least that's that's for me. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm way off. But uh, fracture repair. I guess you know I always ask myself two questions. You know, is it fixable? Number one, and should it be fixed? Number two. So, is it fixable? How many pieces of radial head are we talking about? Uh, anything above two really kind of tamps my excitement for ORIF down. And if you're looking critically at these, this is what the CT scan shows. Usually the uh, supposedly intact portion of the radial head may have some impaction or a complete fracture line extending. So, so look for that, and that may influence your decision making. Nobody enjoys nailing wet newspaper against the wall, so bone quality certainly comes into uh, the algorithm here. And, and if you think about particularly with terrible triads, the way the radius is positioned, uh, anterior portion of the radial head is usually what gets fractured. Uh, so by definition, it's really not in this safe zone, at least in terms of a surface implant. So if it's going to require anything above and beyond screws, that may uh, not be a good idea. Thinking about widely displaced fracture fragments that have no soft tissue attachments, I worry about healing potential. So maybe that pushes you towards an arthroplasty. Having something metallic and um, not fragile in there at time zero, maybe a benefit for stability purposes. And 
if you remove the radial head, that may facilitate the rest of the operation. So these are all things that come into the calculus. Age, not so much. I mean, you have to do what you have to do. This is a pretty uh, simple situation, not really a fracture dislocation, but just like what you would call, I suppose, a Mason II uh, displaced. Um, good bone quality gets fixed with screws, as you see here, falls up for two months, and then I can only assume is living his best life. This uh, had to take a, a deep dive into the archives, and I, I think this is the only case of a fracture dislocation where I ended up fixing the radial head, and maybe I'm way off, and my practice pattern needs to be adjusted, but to me, these are just extremely rare. This is a little bit of a bizarre fracture mechanism, maybe not in St. Louis, Missouri, but uh, at large, yes, it's a ballistic Montasia variant, so the ulna is fixed, and I felt like in this case, a large enough segment of the uh, radial head still with soft tissue attachments and uh, a reasonable read and good stability that's uh, fixed as you see there. So let's uh, segue to this case, which takes us more into the arthroplasty domain or radial head replacement, I should say. <clears throat> Terrible triad, nothing special. CT shows a little bit more. Um, you can see that one fragment of the radial head that is widely displaced, but the rest of it that is quote unquote intact is really not, you know, this is like a C type fracture of the radial head. So, um, this patient gets the treatment that you see here, radial head replacement, ligament repair, coronoid repair. And so why are we replacing radial heads? Generally speaking, because we're not fixing them, uh, as we just discussed, you know, it is a, a static stabilizer to some degree. And like Dr. Chu taught me in fellowship, it also provide some longitudinal instability. I suppose we could all be resecting radial heads, but if there's an unrecognized Essex Lepresti lesion, that, that would be a very poor choice just because of the longitudinal instability, uh, which can be prevented by putting in uh, a radial head replacement. So these are your implant options. You know, the, uh, I suppose there's two camps here. You have the anatomical type implant, which is elliptical, just like the uh, normal radial head and you and I, uh, the intent here is to reproduce the anatomy and there, therefore reproduce the normal radio capitellar motion and potentially have uh, improved longer term outcomes. Fixation um, can vary, but I think the more popular models now are this press fit. Uh, the other camp is the non-anatomical, and I guess it's like, you know, radial head replacement for idiots um, or me specifically. Um, these are just circular shaped, they're, they can be thought of as just a, a spacer. Um, this model or this uh, type that you see here isn't cemented. It isn't press fit. It's just put in and meant to be uh, a spacer. And so I think technically it's a little bit easier, potentially a little more forgiving for the surgeon, maybe not the patient. This is a, a nice uh, review article. Check it out. It uh, goes into some of the nuances of sizing of a radial head uh, replacement, which I think is really the key to uh, this portion of the operation in terms of treating elbow fracture dislocation. So in terms of diameter, you know, as, as I mentioned, the radial head is uh, elliptical in its shape. And so you want to take the smaller of the two diameters. And even then you probably want to downsize. So this is probably the best way to do it that I've found reconstructed on the back table. And then whatever uh, company you're using, they generally have some kind of template to use for that. With regards to height, uh, if you happen to have a scenario such as this, where it's a on-block radial head and you can just compare it to their trials, uh, that's one way to do it. Again, downsizing uh, would be the uh, key there. That's usually not the case. So then you have to use these other cues. And this is one that I think is actually the most useful, which is to look at the lesser sigmoid notch. And uh, what you want to do is definitely not have that radial head proud relative to the lesser sigmoid notch, flush or probably even better, slightly recessed a millimeter or two. So that's something that you can put in the trial, assess, and uh, determine the height's appropriate. You can do a fluoroscopic evaluation. And if you have uh, obviously very flagrant situation, which you can see on the top right, where there's lateral or gapping of the ulnar humeral articulation, that's a clearly overstuffed scenario, but I, I find this somewhat tricky just depending on how flexed or extended the elbow is, and I guess I rely more on uh, looking in the wound and assessing directly with the lesser sigmoid notch. There is this uh, radiocapitellar retinacular fold. I haven't 
uh, use that in my own practice, but after preparing this presentation, perhaps I'll be looking for it in the future. Approaches, Dr. Davies talked about, uh, these are kind of the two camps, lateral versus working through the fracture, kind of a shotgun type approach to get to the radial head, and there are pros and cons. I think before you even think about the approach, you have to think about how you're going to position the patient, and this is something that Jonah, again, already mentioned. So for me, uh, I think there are reasons to do it supine and reasons to do it prone or lateral, depending on your preference. For me, if the ulna is simple and I'm, I'm more concerned about what I'm doing with the radial head or the, the ligament component of the injury, and if also the fracture extends more distally, such that the ligaments, if they are intact, you, you would really have to do a lot of work and potentially even destruction of ligaments to be flipping that fracture fragment up. That's, an in, that's a scenario where I'm going to be doing it supine. So I kind of compromise on dealing with the ulna and prioritize the radial head. Now, the opposite is um, the prone situation. This is a complicated ulna fracture. I really want to devote kind of all my positioning resources towards treating that. And for me, that's with the arm prone and more stable position rather than having an assistant trying to maintain alignment, which is incredibly painful if you've ever been there. And then, uh, then you can address the radial head however you want. You can work through the fracture, uh, shotgun type um, approach, or you can even make a separate soft tissue window laterally and, and get at it that way. So just some examples of this. This is a pretty simple ulna fracture. Um, the fracture sends pretty distally. So I think this is something that I, I feel I can get reduced with the patient supine. And then I just go about my business addressing the radial head um, through a uh, standard uh, Kaplan or Coker interval. So that is what we did. And uh, well, I guess the other situation here, she has another uh, injury that's being addressed. And so rather than flipping her prone and then supine and all this stuff, we can just do everything prone. Here's the uh, converse uh, situation, pretty uh, comminuted proximal ulna. To me, this is something that's going to take a lot of uh, concentration and effort to get right. And so that's uh, probably for me best prone. Also, that proximal segment is pretty short. So I feel like we can reflect that up and get to the uh, radial head through a shotgun type approach. And that's what we did there. Uh, this was a case earlier, earlier in my practice. And, um, you know, I, I think if you just anticipate there's going to be instability, it's not such a big deal when you encounter it. And so some things I could have done differently, you know, probably restoring a little more of that proximal ulnar dorsal angulation, but um, overall the elbow is stable at six months and the guy does okay. So uh, in conclusion, I think the key really to all this stuff uh, is recognizing what, what injury pattern, what fracture pattern you're, you're dealing with. And then you can uh, anticipate the challenges you're gonna encounter. To me, it starts with position and approach, and that really sets you up for success with having a good plan. Or I often select cases, but uh, quite honestly, it's it's mostly radial head arthroplasty and uh, these fracture dislocations if the radial head is injured. So use all the cues that you got, and ultimately, it always downsize if there's any question. And uh, yeah, addressing all the points of instability should result in something reasonable outcome-wise. All right, thanks, Marshall. That was really good. Uh, we're going to tee it up for <clears throat> Andy Chu now. Um, there's great questions in the Q&A section. We are going to talk about some cases after this talk. Uh, we just wanted to give everybody sort of a um, a good overview of the topics and then the, the cases after. But please feel free to ask questions, even if they're not exactly co covered by the topics of this talk. And we're happy to answer them either live or in the chat. So, Andy, why don't you take us away? Jonah, can I ask some questions real quick, too? I, 100%. So Marshall, I'm just curious for both of you guys, um, you know, Marshall, you answered it a little bit. Like, it sounds like you're doing a lot of arthroplasty. Are, are you doing like 85, 15 arthroplasty RIF? Um, this is a multi-part question, number one. And then number two, when you're doing a radial head slash neck RIF, are you using plates or using a tripod fixation or do you, do you is one better than the other? Have you found? So yeah, uh, mostly radial head replacement as I already, already said. Uh, I just don't, you know, see, to me, it's like either it's going to be treated non-op or, or uh, replaced. And to me, there's just not that many that fall into this fix-it category, but that's uh, personal preference, perhaps. Uh, fixing it, um, either it's just screws. I haven't done the tripod, but uh, I think that's a, 
compelling technique. Haven't done it myself. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm like 95% replacement, I would say. Um, and if fix, it's either going to be a plate because it's an extending very distal into the neck and, and into the uh, shaft or tripod if it's uh, if it's just proximal and it doesn't need. Because I do think that plates really bother patients, uh, even one, five plates, really low pro. Um, and so unless it extends down the shaft, I try not to put plates on. Okay. Just curious to see what the get the temperature of the room. And now show us a, all slides of plating the radial head. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's interesting because when I started, I plated a lot, and then I had a lot of failures, and then I started replacing like like not like you like ninety five percent, and then I've sort of gone back a little bit the other way. There was that um, study out of shock that showed pretty good results with ORF, and I've in younger patients, I've started trying to give it a chance, and so far I haven't been horribly disappointed, but I'll let you know. Yeah, I do think that the, the one thing Marshall said in his talk, which is very interesting, or is that if you have um, borderline stability, I think fixing the radial head is the worst of both options, because what happens is you're compromising your fracture stability and your elbow stability. You're putting a lot of extra strain on the construct that doesn't need it. So in those cases, I think the radial head arthroplasty gives you improved stability of the elbow, and then you're offloading the the radial head fixation because you don't have it anymore. So that, that would be something I, I, I agree with. Totally. That I would second that third that as well. So, <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to coronoids and I'm going to try to get through this fairly rapidly. I think some of it's already been covered so we can get to cases. So we're going to review some classifications and talk about the coronoid fracture patterns and then how they apply to fixation strategies. So, you know, there's always some depressing slide about how much people remember from a talk. So I'm going to say this now, if you remember only one thing about coronoid fractures is that they don't occur in isolation. So, you know, you have a pattern like this and you could say, well, clearly there's a lot going on here more than just the coronoid fracture, but you have something like this where you can barely see a small coronoid tip fracture. And we'll talk about this elbow did see some sort of stress besides just that fracture. So um, it's always good to go back and look. Uh, this is the historical sort of Reagan Mori classification. This was based on a lateral view of an x ray. And so the type one was a tip, type two was just less than 50%, and type three was greater than 50%. And, you know, everything was good, and people used this, and it was uh, well agreed upon, and, and things were good. But I think this was really an advance. This is Sean O'Driscoll's classification of coronoid fractures, and this was really based on things that people were seeing in anatomic classification, which type one was a tip, type two was anterior medial facet, and then type three were basilar fractures. And really, um, as you'll see, it, it really is a mechanistic uh, classification that also helps guide treatment approaches. Of course, like all good things, you know, subtypes were all good classifications. Further subtypes were described to uh, diminish inner and intra-observer reliability. So here you are in case you're interested. But the main thing to remember about uh, this O'Driscoll classification is that it really does correlate with fracture patterns. So if you have a type one coronoid fracture or coronoid tip fracture, just like I showed you here, at some point, the elbow at least tried to dislocate, sublocate, subluxate. Something happened that that uh, coronoid tip was avulsed. And this is typically posterior lateral rotatory instability patterns. With type two, the anterior medial facets, this is the kind of injury pattern you see. And this is a completely different instability pattern that Jonah talked about, which is a varus posterior medial rotatory instability pattern. And then the type three basilar patterns are associated with whatever your choice of uh, transalecranon or posterior montagia variant. And we might get into that classification a little bit, uh, but um, these are associated with these uh, different kind of fracture patterns. And you might say, okay, well, that sounds good in theory, but is that really real life? And the answer is, it, it really is. So there's this is a study by Day Ring out of a Journal of Hand Surgery where they did this fracture heat map, looking at the types of coronoid uh, fractures and they, uh, they correlated them with the type of injury pattern. It really does hold up very well. The type one fractures you often see in terrible triads uh, and type two are almost exclusively in the varus posterior medial and the basilar ones are in these other fracture patterns. So I would say that there's a lot of confusion still about this and because both of these classifications are still used, even though I think probably the O'Driscoll one is a lot more robust, but people still talk about papers modern about the type one and type two reagan mori classification, which just adds, I think, a little bit to the confusion about it. So going forward, at least for this talk, we're gonna just talk about the O'Driscoll classification. So starting with type one, 
Again, these are a, a part of a val very, uh, sorry, valgus posterior lateral rotatory instability pattern, which is by far the most common pattern. And this is the most common pattern with simple elbow dislocations. There is a predictable circle of injury starting on the lateral side, going across the anterior posterior capsule and ending on the medial side. And you can have sort of these different stages going from reduced to just a little bit of posterior lateral rotatory instability to essentially dislocated. And it's important to remember that terrible triads are uh, sort of a subset of these injury patterns. This is the same uh, injury pattern we talked about here. And the difference is you start here on the lateral collateral side, and it usually evolves probably 90, 95% time off of the origin. And then the radial head impacts onto the capitellum of the posterior lateral capitellum and, and is usually a comminuted C-type fracture pattern with displacement. And then the coronoid tip of all scissor is knocked off by the rest of the trochlea as the elbow completes this dislocation. Joda mentioned this paper. This is the sort of the seminal work on the uh, treatment algorithm for these. And, and the important thing from uh, sort of a practical standpoint is you're addressing all the structures from deep to superficial. So you're looking here with the radial head out, you're looking at the coronoid uh, and the anterocapsular insertion. So you start deep with the coronoid. This has been described using sutures and uh, an ACL guide. Uh, on occasion as well, address the radial head, repair the LUCL, and then do something with the medial side or an X-fix if you're really still unstable. This is just a class or sort of a prototypical injury, posterior dislocation. You see the radial head impaction like Marshall had mentioned. This is a wire just to hold the coronary tip while sutures are passed, radial head trial, um, stability test like Jonah mentioned. And I typically will get an X-ray and a splint just to prove before I leave the operating room that the elbow is stable and reduced. So how do we fix these fractures, these coronoid tip fractures? Uh, again, we mentioned suture. You can use wires, which I've done fully threaded wires to grasp that coronoid tip fracture. If the fragment happens to be large enough, which I would tell you is unusual, you can use screws or you can in theory use a buttress plate. Although again, if you're using a buttress plate for a coronoid tip, you probably want to check what kind of coronoid fracture you're really fixing. But I think probably a, maybe a little bit more controversial or more current topic is really, should we do anything with these? Um, again, with the suture fixation, these are an, usually often just an anterior capsular repair. And if you remember sort of the primary and secondary stabilizers of the elbow, the anterior capsule is not one of them. So thinking about it conceptually, what does the anterior capsule really do when you repair it? Only in full extension does it really provide much stability. Like most capsules in the body, it's only taut when you're in, in, um, at the terminus of motion. And so maybe the thought is if you're repairing the anterior capsule, all you're really doing is preventing people from getting full extension. Well, that's nice in theory, but does it work out in clinical practice? And the answer is yes, there are at least two or three papers uh, about not fixing coronoid tips and terrible triads, and people seem to do okay. So be curious to see what the panel thinks about this and whether they've started doing this or not. I'll tell you that personally, I have started ignoring more coronoid tip fractures than maybe I should, but uh, again, so far so good. So moving on, type two fractures, again, anterior medial facet fractures. Here's a quick case example, polytrauma. This guy also complained of some elbow pain. His elbow x-rays look pretty innocuous. You see maybe a little coronoid fracture there. Is that really a big deal? Well, here's the CT, and you can see that this is a comminuted anterior medial coronary facet fracture in the operating room. You get a stress test, and you, you know, well, what is this injury pattern we already told you? This is varus posterior medial rotatory instability. It's much less common in my experience, and the components are an LUCL injury and anterior medial coronoid uh, fracture. But importantly, to distinguish this from a terrible triad, your radial head is usually intact, and that's because the lateral side is your tension side, and the medial side is your compression side. How do we get there? Joan has already talked about this a little bit. There are multiple approaches. I kind of prefer the FCU split approach. Uh, gives you good access and visualization of your coronoid. You do have to mobilize the ulnar nerve posteriorly, but it gives you good access and uh, visualization for uh, buttress plate fixation, which is what we did here, an intermedial approach, provisional fixation, and then a buttress plate. And six months post-op, still reduced, still looks good. And again, there's the, the hallmark of the lateral collateral ligament repair, which is you still have to do in this fracture pattern. Finally, uh, moving on to type three fractures. Here's just a quick example. 28-year-old female MCC has this injury. I like 3D CTs on elbow fractures. And you can see that she's got a very large basilar coronoid facet fracture. Is this a trans olecranon? Is this a poster montage variant? Nothing really looks dislocated. We can talk about the semantics of the classification, but uh, either way, you know what you have to fix. 
So how are you going to position them, approach it, sequence implants? Um, I think this has already been talked about to some degree and to, in the uh, interest of getting to cases, I think here are the approaches. It's been described that you can work through the fracture. These are, there are no, multiple examples of something like this. And I would tell you that I, I don't know that you can really see that that well, the articular surface just working through the fracture unless you truly do a shotgun approach. Um, a lot of times people will talk about just reducing the primary olecranon portion and then doing a separate medial flap and doing a medial approach, which is definitely an option. But I think one of the important things, and I try to harp upon this uh, with my fellows, is that know your collateral ligament anatomy. If you know your anterior band of the MCL is right here, it inserts on the sublime tubercle, well, then you know that this is all sort of fair game. You can get to this, and oftentimes these basilar fractures will have a good apical read distally, and it's distal to the uh, ligament insertion. So you can actually just sort of elevate the uh, FCU, the ulnar head, look at your reduction clamp, it, and that's exactly what we did in this case. So reduced it with the clamp, independent lag screws, and then just fixed the electron on with a standard fixation construct and everything is good. So one year post-op, she ends up doing well. So in summary, again, coronoid fractures do not happen in isolation. You have to remember that something happened to the elbow to get that coronoid fracture. And you have to recognize what your fracture pattern is to uh, inform your surgical approach and technique. We didn't talk about it much in this talk, but we'll hopefully we'll get to in the cases, but you always want to have a plan and a backup plan, like Jonah said, to make sure you leave the OR with a stable elbow. That is a good, good looking group of, of people there. All right, uh, Andy, thanks for that talk. I think uh, while I will be loading this, um, I'll just maybe ask, uh, maybe Marshall, what, what he thinks about leaving the coronoid alone. I personally have told, uh, agree with you, Andy. I've gone to not, fixing as many. I think it depends for me on whether or not the capsule is uh, torn or if that piece is separate. So, and, and if I think that it's really going to help provide extra stability or I'm just over tensioning. And I've actually found that sometimes you repair it and it actually over tensions those uh, patients and, and it's probably not necessary for stability. Um, my typical way of doing these is, is putting the sutures, passing them through doing everything else and then tying them at the end because I've had a few rip out when you tie them at the beginning. And occasionally I've gone, did all that and really the elbow is super stable without it. And I've just pulled the suture out and not repaired it even after having passed all of it. So I think it's, um, it really depends on the, on the fragment, but Marshall, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm repairing them and it, you know, it's a suture repair, essentially just passing through the, um, the anterior capsule as Andy mentioned and, I guess I just do it out of habit and it's not that much more effort. Um, but you are emboldening me to potentially uh, change practice because yeah, I agree. You know, a lot of these terrible triads, at least that I'm taking care of, they may come back with a 20 degree flexion contracture or something like that. Is, is that contributing or is, is that the reason why maybe, I don't know. Yeah, just kind of uh, limiting their extension potentially. Also I've repaired a few and done sort of this dynamic floro exam and felt a little pop pop like yeah. well okay that was fun yeah that's what i'm saying that's why i always tie them right at the end before before closing fascia so okay so here's the first case uh this one is going to be for marshall uh to start with and then andy to come on in after uh because this is your talk this is radiohead replace or fix or both question mark i don't know uh 31 34 year old male who fell at work uh he's pretty stocky guy a large forearm very active manual labor here's his x-ray any sort of um first impressions yeah i mean it doesn't look like uh you know first of all the elbow at least i don't know if he had a reduction done or something but it it doesn't seem like a wildly unstable elbow it looks like the radial head you know extending down into the neck that extends pretty far distally i don't can't make out the details, how many head pieces we, we have. Clearly a CT is in order. Um, I, I blew up the same x-rays for you, just in case I had like Dr. Nork on the on the Zoom so you could see <laughs> what his glasses. Yeah, I'll take a CT, I suppose. Thank you. Okay, so here's the CT. <clears throat> which is, I just took one cut and you can kind of see the radial head, uh, the intact part, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. So some, some, uh, more acute angulation that I would expect of the articular surface. So I suppose that represents some impaction. Now is the cortex still intact? It may yeah, be. Cortex is intact, but the 
the cartilage is impacted. And if you scroll through it, you'll see almost like a, uh, you know, posterior wall last tab, some, some, I guess, marginal impaction with some, um, you know, consolidation of the subchondral bone. So you yeah. see a hyper dense. Okay. So what do you want to do with this guy now? I think quite honestly, I, I would, I would go into this uh, with the intention of, of fixing it uh, potentially, maybe reducing some of that impaction. If we're just talking about two pieces and I'm not, missing something else but um if it's not a super unstable osteochondral situation uh i might see what i can do vis-a-vis -vis reducing the marginal impaction and then you know uh fixing the partial articular fracture yeah because it does this, extend so distally this is a b-type fracture b is for buttress it's like this uh this a tibial plateau of the elbow right like it's typically it's exactly what it is now i'm getting excited yeah Andy, are you are you uh, gonna break out the mini tamps, bone tamps, and do some bone bone tamping up, and then fix it with a buttress plate? How's that going to happen? Uh, I think that would definitely be my first choice uh, or first option. But with all radial heads, it's you always have to book it for RF versus arthroplasty. And then the question is, do you need to do you need to have your more than just your standard radial head arthroplasty available? What does that mean? You get the extra standard one or the special one? Yeah, they can get the long stem. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not all manufacturers have long stem and radial heads. So I think that's something that you would need to consider potentially for this if you think you can't, if you're, it's not going to be fixable. Okay. Yeah, How I think that, that's, uh, I, I don't have any personal experience with the use, using some of these long stem uh, radial head replacements. So, you know, that's like, um, uh, Fatigue makes cowards of us all, right? So I, I, guess, I guess it just gives me the heebie-jeebies to do something that I haven't done before, potentially not know what I'm doing. Yeah, although you do have to start somewhere. So I think, correct. Um, yeah, I think the one thing that you you were talking about in your talk, Marshall, which is good, is, is indications for Radiohead. So uh, you say you do ORF versus Radiohead, Andy, when you, you on the consent, how do you decide intra-op? Is it just kind of like gestalt? Is it really, do you have like a, set of guiding rules that are printed on the or uh you know walls that say you know we'll replace if this 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 or how do you how do you approach that because i think a lot of people have that question they, they don't want to junk a radial head if they don't have to but they really maybe need some guidance on how to do that yeah you know, so you know the classic paper says greater than three fragments uh did poorly um so if you want to hang your hat on some kind of a number i think that's a place to start but adding things like comminution like bone quality like metaphyseal impaction uh like radial neck component to it i think those all are just exponentially more difficult um like marshall said and so you start adding some of those factors in and, and i think it definitely pushes you more toward an arthroplasty and what about marshall what about a like amount of joint or, you know, does that like, a, you know, I, I'm a shoulder guy, you know, we talk about glenoid 20%, we do this, you know, 30%, we do that. Is there, is there any number that sticks up for you? I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think so. I, it really boils down to is, is it uh, of sufficient quality and biology that you can expect a reasonable outcome? Um, I, I don't know if there's a, if there's a humongous piece, but it still has some attachments and it's, a young person, good bone quality, seems like it, that would be a fixable candidate. Yeah, I think when there's, you know, residual impaction on like on this one on an intact segment or of more than 30%, you start thinking about this being difficult to kind of hold up on its own. So just just it pushes me more in the direction of an arthroplasty. Okay, I want to get to the other cases. So I'm just going to show you all what I did. Those were sort of my different options. I think we all talked about it. We didn't really talk about this last one so much. But this is something that I do sometimes uh, for shoulder fractures, proximal humerus fractures. I do a short stem with a long plate or a long plate with a short stem uh, or the opposite long stem with a short plate. And so just I thought maybe I could apply the same thing to the elbow. So here I went in and really the impaction, the bone quality at the radial head was not nearly as good as I wanted to. But the radial neck was a really nice piece. So I thought maybe I could get this reduced anatomically and wired up. Um, and then put a small mini fragment plate on there. That's a one five plate. You can see, I think it looks pretty good. And then I put unicortical screws. Uh, we prepared the radio head arthroplasty and then put the trial in. And then once the trial was in, I actually replaced those unicortical screws with bicortical screws to get really good fixation, knowing that the definitive implant would now fit because we had the done with the trial in there. 
um, and then replace the uh, the definitive um, or put in the definitive uh, component. And then you can see that there's still some residual instability. So we repaired the ligaments. And here he is in pronation, supination. That plate is in the safe zone. Um, and it is very low profile, but still uh, probably ended up bothering him. And so here his elbow is now completely stable. Radial head is uh, nicely positioned. And uh, that's a really good uh, outcome for him. And so here he is fully extended, fully stable. Here's his final x-rays. And so, uh, yeah, he stayed like that. And uh, I just think it's an interesting opportunity sometimes to uh, not use a long stem. I think this patient was rather young. So if I could avoid it in case he needs a revision or something down the line, I uh, didn't want to have to to kind of have a lot of bone loss. Um, any thoughts on that? Should I have done something different? I think that looks great. We have a question saying if, um, would you be able to cerclage and replace, which I think is a sort of a variation on what you did there. I think, um, you know, I think that would definitely be an option in this case as well. Yeah, I think cerclage is good as long as one, you can see the entire bone <laughs> and don't cerclage the posterior osseous nerve. Uh, and two, I think that it has to be a pattern that is going to give you some stability distally, right? So if it's just comminution, you're cerclaging around the radial neck, but there's no co continuity, it's not a B-type fracture, then you definitely can't do it because all you're doing is cerclaging around the prosthesis, still going to be loose compared to the distal segment. So yes, in this pattern i think it's a it's an option just be very careful passing your cerclage around the head there's a question about um metal com uh, uh, biocompatibility and so you know i think that is a good question if you really want to be a stickler in those in that case i didn't actually have any touching between the implant and the metal from the plate um, those implants are typically a titanium with a cobalt chrome and the plate i used there was a stainless steel but I, I don't typically um, really follow that, especially for that type of, of implant. Yeah, I don't, I don't worry about the galvanic corrosion fuel cell scenario so much. Uh, all right, so uh, this case, she's an older lady, reasonably functional. She fell is two weeks old by the time she shows up and uh, lives independently again, so reason, reasonably functional. The um, x-ray shows a comminuted proximal ulna. Looks like the coronoids are separate fragments. Radial head is fractured. Uh, CTs of the 3D varietal for Dr. Chu. So um, I pointed out on the axial just because it's it's almost impossible to discern what the heck is going on on a single cut. But the, uh, the blue lightning bolt is your radial head and the red arrow is the coronoid. The green arrow, which then corresponds to the other images, that is an uh, independent piece of the, I suppose, coronoid that really constitutes also the lesser sigmoid notch. And then the uh, yellow arrow is the rest of that proximal ulna. So um, there, you, there you have it. Uh, Andy, how, how would you start thinking about what you're going to be doing for this patient? So there's a number of concerns, you know, the, the amount of comminution and the fact that the coronoid looks like it's multi-fragmentary with a, a large basilar component that has a sublime tubercle uh, and then a separate more, you know, more uh, a, a tip fragment. Uh, I think the radial head looks like it's comminuted and her bone quality looks poor. So I'm probably thinking about arthroplasty right off the bat. Um, but I think the question in, in these cases that always comes to me is like the, the primary electron portion looks fairly straightforward. It looks like you have a nice cortical read on that central image. But the question is always, am I going to be able to get all of this back together through one approach or am I going to have to make a separate medial flap and go after that coronoid tip? And how important is that? And those are the things that concern me about this case. Yeah, and then, and then also... Um... Jonah, I, I, for me, it's kind of like order of events. Like, how, how am I going to tackle this in a way that makes sense and doesn't hose the patient or add unnecessary operative time? I would say, or hose the surgeon. I think that that's a, you know, very uh, good, good point. It's the main concern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for me, looking at these more and more, I will just open up the frac the main fracture fragment and then kind of see the lay of the land, uh, clean up what I can clean up. And then I start 
positioning the coronoid uh, fragments that you have your green arrow and stuff like that. Um, if there's, it looks like there's a good read on that, at least, um, you know, medially and try to get something lined up and then decide what I'm going to do with the radial head through, through that open fracture bed and then do the radial head and then do the ulna. But um, you have to think about it because you have to be able to size the radial head. And so really you want to have some type of provisional or semi-definitive reduction, at least distally, so that you can get a good idea of what's going on. Right. Yeah. So all, all excellent points. And, uh, you know, just like Andy, Andy said in his talk, you know, that apical uh, or that distal read was indeed good for that coronoid piece as it extends distally. So that was a plus, at least in this scenario. So this is what we did. Patient is prone and we're coming at it through, a, you know, your sort of standard posterior approach. The yellow arrow, there, there is some amount of what I, I believe to be LUCL, but honestly, some of that posterior lateral capsule gets detached in order to mobilize that uh, proximal fragment up. And then we're able to clamp on the right that, um, that fragment with the lesser sigmoid notch. And so now we have a relationship that we can use to start sizing the radial head. So radial head comes out, it's sized, and the trial's put in. That's what that little blue guy is. And um, the radial lucency of the trial, I'm not sure the utility of that, but uh, at any rate, it looks quasi-reasonable. So then we start uh, putting the real implant in. I think in my mind, I probably could have gone down on the diameter even so, but I think the height is good. And that freer in the photograph shows you uh, you know, it's positioned on on the edge of the lesser sigmoid notch. So to me, the radial height is good. And we have now everything essentially reduced, um, especially with relation to the proximal and, and distal fractures uh, in that lag screw is in the um, lesser sigmoid notch piece. So just to keep it going, we have a radial plate that's applied and, and some of that capsule and probably a little bit of the LUCL tissue is passed through one of the empty holes in the plate. And then a, a more um, standard posterior plate is applied as well. Elbow is stable after all of that. So that, you know, just, I think some good uh, picture representation of what it is to work through this shotgun approach, working through the fracture and addressing uh, some of these issues. So that's, that's the case. That's a really good result, Marshall. Can I just ask you, there's a question, uh, shotgun approach, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, mobilizing, basically working through the fracture, proximal segment gets flipped up and you're just hyper hyperflexing the arm so that you're looking end on on the radius. So, you know, like opening a shotgun to load it, if you will. Yeah, basically like you're opening the gun stock of a, or the, the, the shotgun um, barrels so that you can see into it. Um, Marshall, what did you do with the coronoid tip on that? Yeah, one? so uh, efforts were made to try and secure that. And that's what that top left picture, you know, there's a shoulder hook trying to hold that in place and get a screw into it. Screw went into something bony. But I think if you look critically at that image on the right, you know, there certainly are some portions of it that, that don't have screws into it. Now, the elbow is stable and I think it's going to be okay. But Maybe I did start adopting a nor the coronoid tip practice and I didn't even know it. <laughs> you didn't know it. Yeah. And then can I ask you one last question on, you talked about this during your talk about the proximal radial, uh, pro, sorry, proximal ulnar dorsal angulation. What do you mean by that? And what's, what is, how do you affect, how does that affect everything? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the common mistake for me, at least with the ulnar reduction, and, and this is true, even as uh, you get a monta kind of a standard montage as it moves more distally, you, the, the ulna has a little bit of a, a dorsal bow to it. And so if it's flat, if you apply a pre-contoured flat plate, you're going to get some extension into it. And that's going to generate some instability in the ulnohumeral joint itself. So putting a little bit of a pre-bend um, is is always a good idea to restore that proximal yeah. or dorsal angulation. Yeah, that was a study out of London, Ontario, um, about five to seven degrees. Most people have a little bit of proximal radial, uh, proximal ulnar dorsal angulation. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for sharing. What size screw is that, 250? I wish. <laughs> All right, let's get Andy's talk up here, or case. Uh, there is a question in the Q&A about in the case of elbow dislocation with a coronoid tip fracture, how do you decide to fix the coronoid? 
once the elbow is reduced. And I think we kind of discussed the various options. Depends on the fragment, depends on the if it's just a coronoid tip. Um, then typically we all kind of will uh, reduce it if it's large, if it's small or the capsule is torn and it's not really providing much or it's over tightening, then maybe not uh, so much. So unfortunately, there's not a hard and fast rule, but I think kind of looking at in case, case by case, being able to reduce it. And I would say if the fragment is, you know, thicker than, a, than, than four or five millimeters, you're probably definitely um, going to fix it more than less than that. You really have to see if it's adding anything to the stability or not. All right. So we'll try to get through this last case. Jonah, just cut me off if I'm going over. Um, this is a 28 year old female. She was uh, status supposed to roll over ATV accident. Here are her initial injury films. And then she gets a splint, of course. And nothing that looks too terrible. She's not dislocated, frankly. She's got some other stuff going on, um, some other lower extremity injuries, some quick CT cuts. And uh, I mean, just real quick, I'll pose this to either one of you guys. Like, is this an injury pattern? What is is this a named injury pattern? What do we call this thing? What well, do I think it's, to tell you? it's it's a little deceiving in some ways, as you pointed out. Right? It's not like frankly dislocated, but the the flavor to me, what I'm going to call it in my mind, is probably some kind of Montasia variant because I just there's enough of of these. Uh, uh, fragments of the coronoid that probably have some crucial ligamentous attachments. Um, I'm, I'm going into the OR, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to put it back together, but there still may be some ligament work to be done. That's how I'm addressing this mentally. Okay. Yeah, there's an excellent question in the chat. Is this not a transolecranon? I would say no, but Andy, what do you think? So the, the answer is I wouldn't call this a translecranon. If anything, I bet you could make this look like a posterior montasia fracture, but um, I think there is a new Mayo classification that's it's been talked about. I've seen it presented. I don't know if it's out in the literature yet, but I think that will help hopefully clear up a lot of this confusion, um, but we'll save that for another day. But um, I guess, what, are you are you guys planning on positioning this lateral? If you're in, how do you get to the coronoid? If you put it lateral or prone, uh, do you just rotate the arm? Do we need to go after the coronoid? Is this one we can ignore? I think these are some uh, some general questions to think about. In the interest of time, I'll probably skip forward. So one of my partners took her for actual her, her lower extremity injuries and decided that hey, we'll just go ahead and fix it at the same time. I think that's a, a good thing to do, save the patient in anesthesia. They did it with one of our trauma fellows and did open reduction internal fixation through a dorsal approach. And fix the olecranon portion. And you can see that maybe there's a little bit of subluxation. Maybe is that a little bit of sag? It's hard to say. But this is the end result. And they put her in a splint because they were a little bit worried about the instability in the operating room. And of course, I'm out of town, you know, living, living my best life, as Marshall said, <laughs> probably away on vacation south of France or something. I don't know. Um, you get, what do you guys think? Overall, good, not good? Well, I, I wouldn't pick up the phone. I'd just keep drinking the rosé. You know, that would be <laughs> the way to go. Um, you could, you know, the first image, you can already tell the elbow is unstable where the, the clamps are on. And I, I think, unfortunately, some of these critical portions that have meaningful soft tissue attachments, they need to be put in place. So, uh, not not just the simple olecranon for sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And if you look at your last image, you know, even though it looks kind of well reduced in the splint, uh, there's I would agree that on the extension view, there's some instability. And to me, the middle section of the plate looks like it's missing screws that should be going up into the fragments that we saw in the pre-op CT. Uh, I don't see much holding that back. So I don't know. Um, you know what's going to happen, but I, I kind of am suspicious. Okay, so there's your immediate post op. She's in a splint. She doesn't look, frankly, it doesn't look terrible in the splint. So, question: What should we do? They call me at this point and said, "What do you think? Uh, is this okay? Does it look okay? What should we do?" And I said, "I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally comfortable with the floor images." So I, I said, "Let's just get another CT and take a look." That first image, I'm sorry, is not very good. The cuts aren't very good, but now I finally get the 3D that I wanted. 
And I will tell you that on when I scrutinize the CT, her elbow is reduced in the splint and on the CT right now. But you can see that she has a comminuted coronoid fracture that's not really addressed. And the question I had is, is this going to be a problem? So what should we do now? A, looks great. Just take the splint off, let it ride. B, let's just, let's be prudent. Let's take it slow, splinter for a couple of weeks, and then allow some protected motion. C, bring her back to the OR, EUA, and then maybe suture repair the, that coronoid down. D, bring her back to the OR, EUA, and then maybe just fix it. Or E, just fix it. Why do you even, why are we even talking about an EUA? So I don't know. I, I don't know the right answer to this. I'll, I'll show you what I did, but these were the things in my mind because she was reduced and I had a talk with her and I said, listen, I don't know what the right answer is for this. You might be stable, you might not be, but it may be worth bringing you to the operating room and taking a look. And yeah, I think I think for me, this one, your, your EUA is going to depend on how much you want to, you know, make it unstable because if you pivot around the lateral side and push that medial piece, there's no anterior check ring, there's no buttress there. And that'll be, you know, you may not be able to get it frankly dislocated, but I'm sure you'll be able to show some instability. And I worry a lot about this pattern having subtle instability that goes on to early arthritis. So I would say to me, it would be probably a combination of D and or, or E. Yeah, yeah. I, the EUA to me would only help to kind of satisfy my level of curiosity of like how unstable is it and uh, in in which directions or which vectors, but it it I don't think it's inherently stable and I would have concerns about watching it or inheriting it at some point. Okay. So I love that. That's a, This is what I thought. So this is the intra-op stress exam. So I bring her to the OR, she's asleep, and I range her elbow and and I thought this was an interesting case because this is exactly the normal stress exam I do for like a terrible triad, which is I take it, I take it through a range of motion with a lateral view uh, through extension. And I look and in extension, she's solid. She's reduced. She's not doing anything. That's extension in uh, supination there on the far right. Radial head drops back a little bit, but really nothing too terrible. Her, her, her elbow seems to be pretty stable, but when you think about the injury pattern, again, this is now just a coronoid deficient elbow. So this is not the pattern of instability you're going to see. So what I do is then I flex her to 90 degrees and I push, I rotate, pivot off the lateral side, like Jonas said. And this is what you see now. So all of a sudden, now you see the uncovering of her ulnar humeral joint. Now you can see the instability. Her distal humerus is going anteriorly through, through the deficient coronoid. So I think this is a... Um, you know, this was a good learning case for, for the people who were the fellow and sort of for me to see this illustration of what a coronoid deficient elbow looks like. So then we took her and I just ended up doing a completely separate approach. I, I figured that uh, obviously I don't think a suture repair is going to be satisfactory in this case. So I ended up doing a separate medial approach, FCU split and uh, buttress plate fixation of that coronoid. Recheck her at mid arc. She's good, stable. And I did splinter just to be safe, but two months follow up, her elbow remains reduced, hasn't gone on to rapid arthritis yet, knock on wood. But uh, I think this was a, a good learning case. And I'd be curious to see if you guys would just do this right off the bat or, or how, how heroic you would be about just trying to get those coronoid fragments through a dorsal approach. You know, I, I think if you had been there during the initial surgery and you were able to corral those pieces from the back with like a dental pick or something like that, and then stick it with some mini fragment fixation um, and get it stable, then maybe that's an acceptable. But really, like I was trying to say at the beginning, there was no fixation going into any of those pieces. There's nothing holding it back. There's really no way that that was going to be stable uh, with an anterior medial force. So I think this is exactly the right thing. I probably would have ended up doing that anyways. So, you know, if I was lateral, I would have either rotated the arm and try to go or just, you know, reposition supine and, and go back and do it, you know, with the elbow externally rotated. All right. Nice result though. So, okay, well, um, we made it on time, so uh, we won't get in trouble with the AO uh, upper brass. And um, I think this was a really good uh, basic slash advanced uh, elbow uh, webinar. I think it went over the, the basic pearls of, you know, classification, identifying the 
instability, but also a little bit more complicated what to do what to do with those specific cases where you have something that's a little bit more complex and maybe give some some tips and tricks um, of how to get those done. I think there's maybe one last question that we'll be able to get to in the Q&A. So what patterns do you cl clinically see with the relevant HO? When do you treat and uh, how do you treat? So maybe Andy, what do you do for HO and what do you see these happen in? Um, what I do for HO is usually a surgery and excise it later when it happens. Um, okay. I, I don't have a predictable way other than like extreme situations where there's extreme muscle damage, burn or something like that, where um, it's going to be predictably need another operation. So I, I don't generally prophylax against it. Okay. Um, I will tell you that we did a paper looking at terrible triads and when there's more hepatotic ossification. And those that have either delay to reduction or multiple dislocations. So they reduce an outside hospital, they come to you and they're dislocated, get reduced again, or they read, you know, something like that. Those ones are almost always end up with um, heterotopic ostication. I will give people prophylaxis, but they don't really take it in my experience. And so I will take out just like you, the excision uh, surgery. I usually do it at about um, six months after, uh, just depending on, on how it evolves and how it stabilizes. Because if you go too soon, I've been defeated in the past where it, it comes right back. And so I kind of wait till it matures a little bit. Yeah. Anderson for that, sorry. Jonah? Uh, yeah, actually, I've gone to giving uh, without brand name, but Celebrex just because it's more tolerated. And there's a couple of papers in the hip literature that show that it's just as effective, i.e. Okay. not that effective, but still better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then, okay, last question of the night, because it is 6.08. Uh, any role for a direct anterior approach with uh, anterior medial facet? I know Mike Gardner's talked about it and he showed yeah. a case and it looks awesome. I just, I, I don't have the balls to do it. And uh, I honestly, I haven't had the need with the anterior medial approach. So for me, I just have no experience. Yeah, I've done one with him in a cadaver lab, but that's the extent of my experience. Marshall? FCU split. Uh, yeah, he, you know, uh, Mike Gardner shows that if you look at the anatomy, uh, it's actually quite safe. Um, if you find Lacertus and know where to go and you can make a direct anterior approach. And really for those small or I shouldn't say small, for the large coronoid pieces, but where the distal extent of the fracture is anterior and not more medial, and you want to get a direct buttress, it's a much better vector for that, as opposed to lifting up and having your plate a little bit off axis. So right. I think it's a, this is a, it's a really good approach. Um, if you can try it out in a cadaver at first, I would recommend it strongly so that you don't get into trouble uh, with a neurovascular structure, but otherwise, um, yeah. All right, this concludes our webinar. I'd like to thank uh, Andy Chu and Marshall Burks. You guys did an amazing job on short notice, uh, and I'm really happy that we were able to do this. And um, thank you to everyone who attended. Have a good night.